Good evening. My name is Per Luigi Olivero, and I'm the chair of the chair. Welcome to the Planning Commission meeting. The parking validation machine is located at the top of the stairs. Insert the ticket when the light is green. Following roll call, we will review how the public may provide comment. But first, we will turn and stand and salute the flag and say it in unison since sometimes everyone doesn't get all the words straight. All right. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, commissioners. We'll now go on to the roll call. Uh, Commissioner Lardinois. Here. Commissioner Barosio. Here. Commissioner Cantrell. Here. Commissioner Casey. Here. Commissioner Garcia. Here. Commissioner Ornelas Wise. Here. Commissioner Rosario. Here. Commissioner Young is, we'll get to that. And Commissioner Tordillos. Here. And I think at this point in time, we have to announce that Commissioner Young is remote and he's invoking uh, the state law that allows you to take the meeting remote. And I think we'll turn it over to him to provide the reason to the commission. Commissioner Young, are you there? He may join us a little bit later. I understand he does have childcare responsibilities. So, uh, he's on. oh, he is on? Uh, yes, I'm on, thank you. And then I think uh, Commissioner Young, per the city attorney and per state law, not, you know, not us, <laughs> you're supposed to share the reason to validate uh, being remote. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I'm currently uh, taking care of my grandchildren and I'm not able to attend the meeting. So respectfully uh, ask the commission's permission to attend remotely. Okay, thank you. And now we as a commission, uh, I think we can just voice uh, all in favor of that. Aye, no one opposed, great. We shall move on to the summary of hearing procedures. And I think the city attorney has a comment. Just one quick thing, uh, Commissioner Young, just so you remember that before each vote or mm -hmm. action, you have to uh, disclose whether anyone 18 years of o or over is present in the room. Or the smile of a grandchild. Okay, moving okay. on. Thank you. Okay, summary of hearing procedures. If you would want to address the commission, please fill out a speaker card located on the tables on the first floor and the top floor and deposit completed cards in the basket. The procedure for this hearing is as follows. After staff's presentation, applicants or appellants have five minutes. During public comment, the chair will call out names on the submitted speaker cards. As your name is called, please line up on the stairs. For those who attend the web meeting, the meeting technician will connect, connect those persons who desire to speak to the commission so they may be heard. Generally, each speaker will be given up to two minutes and speakers using a translator will have double the time. At the discretion of the chair, the time allotted to each speaker may be changed depending on time management of the meeting. After public testimony, the applicant and her appellant may make closing remarks for up to an additional five minutes. Planning commissioners may ask questions of the speakers. The public hearing will then be closed and the planning commission will then discuss and vote. If you challenge these land use decisions in court, you may be limited to raising only those issues you or someone else raised at this public hearing or in written correspondence delivered to the city at or prior to the hearing. The Planning Commission's actions on rezonings, prezonings, general plan amendments, and code amendments is advisory to the City Council. The City Council will hold public hearings on these items. Section 20.120.400 of the Municipal Code provides the procedures for legal protests to the City Council on rezonings and prezonings. The Planning Commission's actions on conditional use permits is appealable to the City Council in accordance with Section 20.100.220 of the Municipal Code. Agendas and all staff reports for this meeting may be accessed on the City website. So uh, now we'll call to order, uh, orders of the day, and before we begin, oh, go on, City Attorney. Uh, just as we uh, get going with the meeting here, I just wanna make sure uh, we give some time for any commissioners who have had any ex parte communications with any third parties with interest before the commission. Is there anyone? Commissioner Cantrell. Yeah, I received a text message uh, today from someone working uh, for a grocery outlet, uh, basically, the, just saying that um, the percentage of the floor usage of the the store uh, was lower than average, and I said thank you, and that was it. So. 
So, so uh, City Attorney, to be clear, if we receive an email, for example, that says, uh, I have an opinion on the project and it's from the applicant, you need to disclose you received an email? Or it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's advisable to disclose all ex parte communications. Um, if you just receive something without any uh, response, um, I'll leave that up to you, but I, advisable to disclose all ex parte communications. And you don't need to describe the actual communication, just the that you fact received, that received uh, some something. Type of yeah. text. That's right. Hey, there you go. There you go. Fair enough. Okay. Uh, before we begin, I want to remind the Planning Commission members of the public to follow our code of, code of conduct displayed on the agenda. And if you don't abide, you may be asked to leave the meeting. Uh, this meeting of the Planning Commission will now come to order. Uh, now is time for public comment. Comment on items that are not on the agenda, but pertain to municipal government. Uh, Non-agendized items, uh, you know, we can't speak about those, can't take any formal action, uh, but we could always suggest it and bring it back. Uh, staff, do we have any, I don't have any cards. Do we have one, anyone on the online ver, uh, meeting that wants to speak during public comment? Yes, we do. Uh, Paul Soto. Okay, great. Okay, Paul, um, let me mute you. Okay, go ahead. Can you hear me? That's, we can hear you, Paul. Thank you, uh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, what, uh, what happened last week, I was extremely offended by that. What I had asked of the council is simply, I would like to make my comments after the presentation rather than before. This was an agendized item. When I was refused, I asked again because I would like to make an informed position about the topic after I, I reiterated my request. When I reiterated my request, the chair said no and then cut me off. Now, you exercise powers that you don't have. I wasn't out of line. I wasn't out of order. I simply reiterated my previous request. You your job was to deny that request once you denied that re second request i had my public comment time to speak and to address the issues that and the decisions that you make and i don't need a lecture i don't need an editorial after i'm finished talking either because you have a habit of doing that you have a habit of editorializing everybody's comments on you and i'm sick and tired of it i want to hear your mouth what I want to hear is exactly what I'm entitled to, and that is information regarding what the policies that are passed in this city. And I simply, as a citizen, as a consistent citizen that comes to these meetings on a regular basis, reads your memos. I listen to you all night long, all night long. You could have accommodated that, but you chose not to. And not only did you choose not to, you went ahead and disrespectfully just cut me off. I'm going to let you do that one time, one time. That's it. You're not going to do that to me again. Let's have a good meeting. Thank you for the comment, Paul. And to be clear, the staff did make the presentation and there was provided opportunity to speak at that time. And then uh, there was no, no one decided to speak. So we moved on to the rest of the discussion and the rest of the meeting. So there will always be time when we request for public comment after staff presentation, and that's consistent. So moving on, we are now on to the consent calendar which contains three items. It contains approval of the minutes, and it has two items, CP 22025, an administering, administrative hearing on the conditional use permit to allow a change in the ABC license, and it requires, has item C, PDC 22001, PD, PD 2201, PT 2202, and ER 2202. As part of the consent calendar, we will take all these items at once. And at this time, I know we do have a card to speak on item 4B. And then if commissioners have questions on the balance, let us know. But I think we'll move on to item 4B and take that comment from a member of the public named Mary Helen Doherty. I almost read your name, liquor license. 
Uh, thank you, I'm Mary Helen Doherty, resident of District 3, and I'm here in opposition to the upgrade of the liquor license at the grocery outlet on Santa Clara Street, and primarily on the grounds that I don't believe it supports the health and well-being of the neighboring communities. And as a member of the Planning Commission, I believe that you are all committed to supporting the built environment that contributes to the success and well-being of San Jose. I believe that's why you serve here. And I understand the Planning Department staff is required to develop their recommendations based on the standards prescribed by the California Department of Alcohol Beverages, the ABC, and they have done a very thorough job of preparing that analysis for your review. However, I believe neighbors are impacted by the related risk factors in their community that, that go beyond the uh, standards set by the ABC. From a public health perspective, sale of alcohol in neighboring restaurants and bars, not just off-sell liquor license, or locations, I should say, are also taken into consideration when assessing the risk of upgrading or increasing availability to alcohol. A number of small family-run corner markets exist that sell hard liquor not far from grocery outlet, but are outside the 1,000-foot radius defined by the ABC. Not only should police activity at the specific store that is being evaluated be considered, I believe pedestrian safety, traffic violations, public inebriate issues, underage drinking, and other community well-being factors that can require police intervention should also be assessed. I believe liquor license renewal uh, review may be the only alcohol-related item in the 2020 general plan other alcohol-related community development factors need to be considered for addition to future amendments to the general plan. I ask you, as you consider your approval of this upgrade for grocery outlet to sell hard liquor, will this upgrade contribute to improving the health and well-being of downtown San Jose? Thank you. Thank you, Mary Ellen. Uh, Mary Helen. Uh, is there any other members of the public that want to speak that are online for uh, this item? Any hands raised? We do have a speaker um, online. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, thank you. Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. As a recovering alcoholic, I know exactly where the liquor stores are. That, that's just like mandatory. And the only liquor store that, that, that sells this type of liquor is in, in proximity to this store is Paul's. That's on 3rd and, uh, that's on 3rd and San Salvador between, uh, uh, I mean, it's on San Salvador between 3rd and 4th. That's the closest. Everything else is a distance. Now, you haven't taken, and the fact that this is on consent is another abuse of your power. That's an abuse of power because you're not allowing any kind of discussion. You're not allowing anything, just consent. We're just going to pass this through. Really, where's the crime report? I want to know the crime report for downtown. Why are they not in this? Why are they not in your memo? Okay, that's number one. Number two, has the police department been assessed? Has grocery outlet understood that they are going to be inviting theft on a mass scale? Believe me, as as the as the downtown proliferation of homelessness increases, which uh, I know most of you don't spend time downtown. I've lived downtown. I've lived in some of those doorways downtown recently, not not in, not in the far distant past, but recently. And so I know what time it is downtown and I, don't, I know what goes on there. I hear the conversations and I walk around and I, and, and I can feel what's going on downtown. And you are going to open up a liquor cabinet in downtown. You're inviting theft. You're inviting domestic violence. You're inviting uh, uh, disorderly conduct and possibly blatant violence and attacks to the, uh, to the city councils, to the commissioners, to the city employees because it's right there and we already know that alcohol leads to domestic violence it leads to theft it leads to uh uh if you test a person when they commit an act of violence you're probably drunk you're inviting trouble thank you 
And any other hands, staff, on the consent calendar? Just on the consent calendar. Does anyone want to speak on the consent calendar that's online? Yes, Veronica Vargas, you can unmute your device. Thank you. Uh, this is Veronica Vargas. I'm the internal senior manager for Grocery Outlet. And I'm here uh, with uh, my colleagues that uh, actually prepare the application, um, Steve Rowland and Kay Short. So we are here to um, uh, be available for any questions that the um, commissioners may have. Um, I want to say that the uh, police department has been consulted. Um, they have um, uh, have weight on this application and staff work for the last year and a half uh, to get us to this point today with a lot of hard work uh, and a lot of um, um, uh, preparation to this point. So I will not take more than that. Uh, we are here to answer any questions that uh, the commissioners may have regarding to any possible um, concerns uh, from the citizens of this board. Thank you. Thank you. And now we'll turn to the commission. I know Commissioner Cantrell. Uh, comment. Okay. No worries. Uh, perhaps let's see if anyone has a question on item B on the consent calendar. Uh, Commissioner Ornelas Wise. Yeah, I um, have a couple questions. I wanted to know the hours of operation. I, I didn't know if it was from 7 to 10 or 7 to 11. I think I had seen something and I, I, I wasn't sure. Yeah, so uh, it's 7 to 10, seven days a week. The original conditional use permit for the site, because uh, it was a different grocery store, was 7 to 11. Okay, so um, now the so, hours have been reduced. Yeah. Just I, I think that's what Grocery Outlet currently operates at. Oh, okay. I mean, we can double check with them, but yeah. Okay, so of course my concern is safety. I've gone to the grocery outlet right next door and I didn't even know if I should get out of my car, you know? I mean, I kind of didn't feel as safe as I think um, I should have. So, um, of course, I have some concerns with the fact that well, anytime we take into consideration a liquor license, we should take it lightly, right? Um, so the fact that it's within... 500 feet of an uh, elementary school in San Jose State is of concern to me as a mother. Um, I did see in the staff report on page four um, that there was some conditions that were going to address site security, employment training, trash, litter, graffiti, site maintenance, loitering, and panhandling. <clears throat> I didn't know exactly what those read. Basically, uh, how are they going to improve through this application? How are they going to improve the site? Sure. And I mean, I would maybe defer to the applicant too, but, uh, you know, they provide us with an operations plan um, that specifically addresses those issues. I mean, things like, uh, you know, sweeping, maintenance, security, training staff, uh, those are all things that we include just as standard conditions in any offset alcohol permit. Um, but maybe if you want specifics for how they actually run the store today, because they do sell alcohol today, I would defer to the to the applicant. Yeah, I'm, I'm just not sure if if they already have those conditions in place. If if by granting them an additional approval, is it going to make it any better? What in addition are they going to do that's different or better? I guess all, all I can say is that those conditions are added now. Previously, they were not necessarily in that conditional use permit from okay. 2011. Um, the only condition that we carried over was for a security management plan. Um, but I think back in 2011, we weren't including those standard conditions for like no loitering or panhandling, things like that. Security, uh, those really weren't, um, I guess, on our radar at that time. Based on what I read on the staff report, it looked like in regards to security, I didn't see any on-site security guard, maybe just security cameras, is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. So I think the original permit only had a security guard if they were operating after 10 p.m. And then they had to have a security guard for the hours between um, when the store closed and when all of the employees were leaving. Um, but I mean, that's something that the Planning Commission could offer up as a, an additional condition. Um, 
Yeah, that would be nice the, to have a security applicant's guard. applicant's open to it, yeah. Yeah, I, I guess what I want to know, you know, as staff, you know, looking at what was approved previously and what is approved today, if by approving this, are we improving the site? Because this application requires additional conditions that are going to improve the site that, by adding additional conditions that weren't there. Uh, yeah, I, I would say I would say it would. Yes, in terms of the conditions that we can hold them to now, with code enforcement, absolutely. The only thing with this project is there is no physical changes to the site, um, and so that's I say like that's a little trickier. Actually, yeah, there's there are no physical changes to this site. It's just for the alcohol permit. If they were coming in to, you know, upgrade the facade or upgrade things like that, we could probably tack on more, but. Right now, it's just a use permit. So, like I said, I would offer this up to the commission. If they have any additional conditions that you think you would like to add, we could discuss with the applicant here. Yeah, I, I would. If there was a, a security guard on site, um, you know, probably as soon as it starts getting dark. Commissioner, I'm going to ask the pause for the city attorney. Well, I'm just going to say, if if, um, if you request to to pull this item, we can have a more you know, okay. thorough discussion. We can have the applicant speak. We can have a staff report, um, other commissioners. I don't yeah. know if there's any further comments from other commissioners about this item, but it might be best to, to pull it for a full discussion, oh, yeah. if that's what you wish to do. I, I would. I would like to. Okay. Okay. So then we'll pull that item to a public hearing to have a further discussion and allow uh, staff to present so everyone has the understanding, baseline understanding and applicant standard. And then I guess on the other item, maybe Commissioner Cantrell, did you want to pull that one as well? Yes, definitely. Okay, well then let's just get a motion on the minutes. So moved. Second from someone? Second. Second. Great. Uh, we shall vote. Uh, Commissioner Lardinois? Yes. Commissioner Barosio? Yes. Commissioner Cantrell? Yes. Commissioner Casey? Yes. Commissioner Garcia? Yes. Commissioner Ornelas Wise? Yes. Commissioner Rosario? Yes. Commissioner Tordillos? Yes. And Commissioner Young? Uh, oh. Yes, and testing, there's no one in the room with me. <laughs> Great. All right, so now we'll move back to item B and allow staff to make a presentation and the applicant, if the applicant's here, they can speak to the item if there's standard time and uh, we can uh, engage in the debate. So, uh, Commissioner, I'll put your comment on hold and come back after the staff. Okay, I introduced myself, sorry. Uh, Alec Atienza, Planning Project Manager, Development Review Team. So we're gonna do, uh, the conditional use permit first, right? Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. okay. All right, just have a few slides for you all. Uh, so just so we all have our bearings and for the members of the public on Zoom as well, we're talking about the grocery outlet actually right down the street from here. It's at 7th and Santa Clara. Uh, so this conditional use permit is for a uh, change in the California ABC license type from a type 20 license to a type 21 license. Uh, so currently it operates with a type 20, which is beer and wine only. And this uh, use permit would change that to a type 21 license for a full range of alcoholic beverages. So that includes liquor. Uh, and the existing grocery outlet was uh, granted a conditional use permit for that uh, beer and wine back in 2011. Uh, so approximately 3.2% of the sales floor would be dedicated to alcohol display. I included a uh, floor plan in the uh, staff report if you're interested. And the hours of operation would be 7 a.m. to 10 p.m., seven days a week as they are currently. Uh, so in terms of project review, we look to California ABC. We look to the San Jose Police Department. We look to the general plan and the zoning code when we're looking at new proposals for off-sale alcohol. And even though this is an existing off-sale establishment, we look at it as a brand new off-sale alcohol establishment anytime we have a new conditional use permit. Uh, so in terms of ABC, uh, this site is not considered over-concentrated. If you look on this map here, they even include Safeway. That license no longer exists, although ABC still um, keeps it in their records. Uh, so over-concentration for the California Department of Alcoholic Beverage Control is Essentially, the ratio of li licenses in the census tract to population is greater than the ratio of licenses to population in the county as a whole. 
So in this case, ABC has determined that the site is not over-concentrated for off-sale alcohol. Um, and maybe just to clarify, when we're talking about off-sale alcohol, we only mean uh, purchasing alcohol and then taking it off the premises to be consumed off the premises. Uh, so the San Jose Police Department also reviewed this proposal. Um, they reviewed the operations plan, the proposal. Uh, generally, they will meet with the applicant as well. Uh, and per the San Jose Police Department, this site is not in an area of high crime, and it was neutral to the proposal. Uh, additionally, as Mary Helen actually mentioned, so the site is not within 1,000 feet of another off-sale alcohol establishment. You can see on the map there. It is within 150 feet of a residence and 500 feet of a school. So that's one of the criteria for off-sale alcohol in the municipal code. Uh, so it's within, obviously, 150 feet of Horace Mann Elementary, as well as San Jose State, down to the south. And there is a daycare up north on 8th Street that's within 500 feet of the site. Uh, so additionally, the project is conditioned to implement a security management plan, and as Commissioner Ornelas Wise noted, that is actually a carryover from their original uh, conditional use permit, and then they have additional conditions that they have to meet um, that we'll discuss as we go forward. Uh, so with that, staff recommends that the Planning Commission consider the exemption in accordance with CEQA, and that's for existing facilities and adopt a resolution approving subject to conditions, a conditional use permit to allow the off-sale of alcohol with a type 21 license. Uh, and with that, I will uh, leave it for any questions. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, does anyone representing the applicant wish to take time and speak on this item or just defer to staff? If I don't see a sign, then I will take that. That's a no. And resume to Commissioner. There is um, the applicant on Zoom. His name okay. is Steve Rawlings. Danielle, if you're there. There's no one here in the audience for that item, is that correct? Okay. Just Mary Ellen. We can Steve, hear you. you can, go ahead. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Steve Rawlings. Uh, I'm here this evening joined with Veronica Vargas who uh, spoke a little bit earlier as well as another colleague, Katie Shart. Um, I was here to kind of give you a little bit of a, a, a brief overview and a, and a specific presentation or some specific information about uh, the operation there in downtown San Jose. Um, as you're aware, the, the, the store has been operating there for quite some time and we have been selling beer and wine. Um, I do want to point out that the previous approval did allow uh, the area for display of alcohol to be up to 5%. Uh, grocery outlet only dedicates about 3.19% of their uh, floor area as compared to the, the overall sales area. So we're well below um, what, what was allowed uh, for that. Um, I, I do want to address a couple of things about security and our overall operations. Um, every, each and every uh, grocery outlet store is managed by a, an operator who is more than just a, a manager. They actually uh, participate in the uh, profits of the store. So they're kind of a partner, if you would. Um, this model has worked very, very successfully with the grocery outlet in terms of being able to get dedicated people uh, that really give their blood, sweat, and tears to, to the business. Uh, those uh, managers are very, very proactive when it comes to uh, interaction with customers, as well as monitoring the activities of the store. In this particular store, there are a couple of employees that are dedicated toward um, what we would refer to as you know, customer service people or AKA security employees that are constantly uh, monitoring activity within the store as well as outside of the store. Um, this store has not been subject to any, any major issues in the past uh, with our operation. And as was noted, uh, this proposal did get reviewed by the San Jose Police Department. And in fact, the San Jose Police Department did provide statistics um, for the, the area. And this store is in Crime Beat Area K2. And uh, for a, a year period of time, there were um, a total of 207 uh, incidences within this particular uh, beat area. The city average is 417. So this is actually um, 
not considered to be a high crime area there. But regardless, Grocery Outlet is always conscientious about trying to provide a very safe and secure environment for primarily, you know, for their customers as well as their employees. And we believe that our store in this particular location has operated without any major um, incidences um, because our staff has been proactive uh, in monitoring the activities there. Um, and we don't see that this would be any type of um, detriment. The display area that is currently dedicated to our al alcohol is not going to be increased by the addition of distilled spirits. Literally what's going to happen is we are just going to replace a shelf that currently carries wine and we would be displaying disp um, distilled spirits. So there, there's not going to be an increase. The display of alcohol is in a strategic location where we have a lot of eyes on that particular location. Uh, and that is designed for a reason. And that reason is to simply be able to have our employees be able to monitor the activity there. Um, the other uh, you know, point that I would, I would like to make um, is the grocery outlet operates about 250 stores in the state of California. Um, all of those stores uh, sell some form of alcohol and many, many of our stores do sell beer, wine, and as well as the distilled spirits. The addition of distilled spirits is really in response to um, customer requests. We are frequently asked uh, by our customers, hey, um, will you guys be carrying this particular type of product? Because most grocery shoppers in the state of California have become accustomed to be able to go to one location and purchase all of the products that they're looking for um, and not have to make a purchase of, 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 of all of their grocery items and then have to get in their car and then make another stop on their way home. Um, and so our request this evening is to be able to fulfill a, 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 you know, a demand or request by many of our customers to be able to do this as a one-stop shop. And we don't inventory a lot, but we do inventory enough that um, our, our customers that are requesting that type of product are able to get that. Um, and, and that is a benefit to the local community because in this particular area, um, there's not a lot of uh, grocery um, options and uh, grocery outlet is, is a very, is very proud of the customer following that we have established in the community. And uh, we would like to just be able to you know, provide uh, an extra inventory item uh, to those customers. So with that, thank you very much uh, for your consideration. Um, uh, we do concur with the staff's recommendation. And for the record, we do agree to all of the conditions of approval that are uh, presented to you this evening. Um, myself, as well as the, our other team members are available for uh, any questions that any of you may have. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. We'll turn back to the commission. I acknowledge Commissioner Barrosio had a comment that I didn't call upon. So Commissioner Barrosio. Perfect, thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, yeah, my initial question was, was based on um, having it be for further discussion. So I appreciate City Attorney Sasueta for, for giving us that, that opportunity in that direction. Um, I do have two technical questions, Ms. Uh, uh, perhaps Dr. Alec Manford, you can you can share some ideas on this. Uh, I did appreciate the owner um, sharing some stats from from the police report, uh, and I wonder in presentations like tonight, um, what's the direction, and um, what should we expect in terms of those stats appearing um, on the staff report? Because if the owner wouldn't have said that, I wouldn't have known some of the stats that he did share, which I think is valuable in having us see the big picture. So Commissioner Boris, the police uh, report is actually attached to the staff report. And staff have also summarized the police reports, the findings of the police report in the staff report with regards to the crime statistics that is not concentrated and is also not over 20% higher than the county's population. And the police also indicated that they are neutral. So yeah. all that information is summarized. And I believe, uh, Alec, if you could point him to the correct pages and the staff reports. Yeah, sure. It's in a few places. But maybe what I would just offer up is, so in our staff reports generally for off-sale, um, 
we will include, and late night use as well, the police review a few different things. Uh, we'll just sort of include a broad overview of what they, what they um, state in their memos. If the recommendation moving forward is to include actual st crime stats, we, you know, we could do that. Uh, that's, that's certainly an option. Right. Um, it wouldn't be too much skin off our back. No, perfect, thank you. Um, and just to clarify my question, yes, um, I did see it myself, but um, uh, let me clarify the question. For anyone tuning in or anyone just dropping in that heard, hey, you know, um, you know, perhaps there's a neighborhood association, you know, that word just got to them. Hey, like tune in, speak up, like, you know, say something pro against, um, either through Zoom or in here in person, and they would not necessarily have gotten the materials that we have access to. Um, and then we have delivered to our inbox. Um, where Com is Commissioner, the, th those are all public items for the members of the public, not just us. Right, well, I guess I would kindly request, um, you know, if I see myself um, uh, in the shoes of an audience member, that if they don't know where to click, if they don't know that that's even a thing, that the only shot they have is whatever we present here. And I guess what I'm asking is, um, if we can surface those um, key stats that, again, we have access to people that know where to click, know where to look, would see it, but for the lay person that you know, just arrives, um, I'm sort of speaking up for them, right? Uh, it would be nice to see those details um, in the presentation at the meeting. Um, and yes, I do understand. And again, I've read it myself that we, we have access um, and there's a way to get access from the public, but it's nice to, you know, just maybe an extra slide to just, you know, to highlight some of those things. Commissioner, so um, because this is available one week before for the public to see, you're suggesting that for every staff report that they do a presentation? For, well, I guess it's, 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 it, it's case by case, right? Like what stat would, would be relevant? What stat would the public like to hear? What stat um, should be um, put to the, like those kind of questions, right? Like, uh, so I guess I would say it's, it's case by case, um, and I guess Co it's all about Marisha, the Yes, uh, your comments or your suggestion is well noted. We'll look into including that information as, um, when needed or when necessary. But I also wanted to note that throughout the planning review process, the project manager has been available to the public. The lady who spoke has actually been in touch, in touch constantly with the project manager who has explained most of the processes. And anyone else also would have had a contact uh, information of the project manager who has been available throughout the process until today. Oh, perfect, thank you. Um, and uh, just a follow-up question. I know that San Jose PD um, offered, offered their research, and this is just for me to just have a better understanding of, of um, who in the city uh, does research in terms of crime stats and stuff like that. Is it only San Jose PD, or is there some division, some department, an employee um, that possibly could be summoned to offer um, research for uh, just for us to have more numbers. Yeah, sure. So uh, it's the San Jose PD Vice Unit specifically that does uh, that we work with for any. So we work with them just in broad strokes. We work with them for any bar application. So if it's just a bar only, not a restaurant serving alcohol, but a bar only, and any late night use. So any establishment that off operates between 12 midnight and 6 a.m. and then off sale alcohol. Those are the times when we consult the vice unit. Um, we've had them come to city council for especially controversial off sale items. Um, I'm trying to think, I haven't had a bar item in a while. Generally they don't come to, <laughs> to come to uh, the commission or city council unless it's extra controversial. Um, and frankly, if they're neutral, they usually don't have much to say. They'll, if they're, they're if they're opposed, they may actually show up um, to voice their opposition because staff can sometimes go against their recommendation. Perfect, thank you. And I think just knowing um, how high the ceiling is with some of this research and you know who we can tap and who, who, who can 
uh, offer offer their expert um, opinion, expert uh, you know stats. I think again would uh, you know help us um, help members of the public just kind of see the bigger picture. So I do appreciate this this uh, clarity that you're providing. Thank you. One other point too, I think that's important just for any of these applications moving forward is understand that the police beat is actually different from the census tract area. So that's an important note. Um, where the San Jose police beat is could be a completely different designation from the actual census tract itself. So good to understand. Thank you. Uh, moving on to Commissioner Tordillos. Thank you. I wanted to start by just uh, disclosing that I also received a text message from the project applicant uh, just asking if I needed any additional information about the project, to which I politely declined. Uh, you know. My main comment here is that as a resident of downtown, I'm sensitive to the concerns that have been raised about crime, the impact on the surrounding neighborhoods. Uh, but one other thing that I wanted to draw attention to that is kind of weighing on my decision here is just the fact that downtown has lost a number of grocery stores in recent years. Uh, so to the extent that, you know, this expanded and upgraded liquor license helps grocery outlet to remain competitive and, you know, increases the likelihood that they're able to continue serving downtown neighborhoods, uh, I'm in support of that. Okay, Commissioner Rosario. Sure, and I, I just had a question for staff. I was just hoping to confirm that, let's see, on December 7th of last year, we had a, another grocery outlet on the corner of Snell and Blossom Hill that was applying to switch from uh, type 20 to type 21. And in that situation, if I'm not mistaken, there was an over-concentrated amount of crime and the police actually gave a negative report. And there was also an over concentration of number of offsite sale licenses within that census tract. Um, and this commission voted nine. I think uh, Commissioner uh, George was absent, but voted unanimously to allow that license to pass. I'm wondering what is the difference between this one and that one, other than being in District 3? I'm not familiar with that application. I think um, it was Jonathan Fox. Um, unfortunately, he's no longer with us, or else I would text him. Uh, he left the city. <laughs> um, I guess I would say just on a general note, the, the one mention that the general plan makes of alcohol currently is to give preference to off-sale alcohol for groceries. So anything that provides fresh fruits and vegetables, we, provide, we give preference to them over just your standard liquor store. Uh, so I don't know the difference between that project specifically and this one. Um, there could be some operational differences, I'm not sure, uh, but I would say that's probably the main reason why staff would still recommend approval. Okay. And Commissioner Rosario, the criteria for determining approval of the conditional use permit for off-sale alcohol is the same for all projects. Okay. Commissioner Rosario. Uh, Commissioner Larnois. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so just as a kind of procedural question um, for staff, the police department, I'm guessing, they only ever are neutral or opposed, right? I would imagine they don't ever indicate approval of an application. Yeah, so, I mean, they are, yes, they will never say they're approved. I've yet to see that. Only neutral or opposed. And you'll very rarely see too many opposed because usually if it's a liquor store, the applicant withdraws. Okay, good to know. And then also, just another procedural question. Um, when it comes to specifically uh, these types of licenses, um, this is the final decision here that we're making, right? This isn't something that we're making a recommendation to council? Yeah, that's correct. So the, in this case, because there's no determination of public convenience and necessity, the Planning Commission is the final hearing <laughs> body. Thank you. Um, so. Yeah, uh, first off, I want to say uh, thank you to members of the public who have expressed uh, their opinions about this. This is, you know, it's why we're here to hear input from the community on these kinds of things because it does, we should be intentional about what decisions we're making for how we run the city. Um, I also want to echo some of the things I've you know, heard from my fellow commissioners, um, you know, particularly what. Uh, Commissioner Rosario said, um, I think when it comes to how we consider these things, we need to be consistent. And 
as has been said, um, when it comes to evaluating these types of applications, ABC and the police are consulted. We there's you know considerations are made about crime levels and the density of existing liquor retailers. And in this case, what we have already in the staff recommendation does add additional operational requirements or operational obligations for the retailer. So I guess I, I don't know what folks are, what the temperature is right now in terms of where folks are feeling on this, but I think if we were to attach additional conditions or to deny this, I think for me to get behind either of those things, I'd need to hear like, okay, well, how are we gonna do this in a way that is consistent moving forward? Um, you know, I particularly, I think in the time I've been on the commission, I don't think we've done either of those things, attached additional conditions to or denied um, an alcohol license application. Um, and then also, Commissioner Tordillos, I was gonna say the exact same thing. Um, it's concerning that there are very few places to buy groceries downtown. Um, and to the extent that this, uh, you know, is a opportunity for a grocery outlet to continue to be a viable business, um, it's definitely something I'm thinking about too. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Garcia. Yes, I, you know, at the risk of repeating what's already been presented, you know, we are looking at a grocery store upgrading their liquor license, right, uh, or alcohol license. It's not a, a liquor store being opened that wasn't there before. Uh, their hours of operation are, they close early, they close at 10 o'clock, right? They're not open late. And the fact that they've been selling beer and wine for the last 10 to 12 years with San Jose State right behind them and had no disciplinary actions by the ABC, I'd like to make a motion to approve this um, based, on, based on those facts. We have a motion and a second. Any further comments, Commissioner Garcia? No, that's it. I'm gonna be supporting the motion. I think supporting uh, grocery stores is fundamental to the city. Uh, not having grocery stores is absolutely terrible when you have food deserts. That means they have to sell alcohol to uh, stay in business because of the higher margin, that's what it is. Uh, and it's also such a minuscule portion of their footprint and sales, et cetera. So uh, any other further comments? We'll just take a vote. Yes. Oh, uh, and city attorney asks, is there any member online that hasn't already spoken on the item that would like to make a comment, assuming that someone joined the meeting midstream. Is there any other hand of someone that, who has not spoken? I don't have any speakers. Thank you. Then we'll move on to the vote. So we have a motion and a second to approve the staff recommendation. Uh, Commissioner Lardinois. Yes. Commissioner Barosio. I think. Um, I'm sorry, it's a yes no vote, Commissioner. I think my neighbor had her hand up to speak oh. before we started the vote. Commissioner so Ornelas Wise, you weren't on my screen. I apologize. So let's pause the vote. Let's go to Commissioner Ornelas Wise. <clears throat> I'd like to see if the applicant would consider a, seg uh, a security guard on site. Um, I don't know if they could hear me or if they could talk. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Hi. Um, a dedicated security guard, we already have um, several employees that are on site that are, um, you know, directed to, you know, monitor the activity. And, you know, we would find uh, having a, a condition that mandated a particular security guard, um, you know, somewhat unnecessary and, and unwarranted. We, we, we go through tremendous efforts to train our employees. And as I said, I think in the past, we haven't had any major issues. So um, we, we would um, not um, want to have a condition that specifies a security guard because we believe that our operations right now are, uh, have been, smooth and, and uh, have been proven to be effective. Okay, thank you. 
And I want to go back to the commission in case anyone else wanted to speak that didn't have an opportunity to make a final comment. Commissioner, uh, you're you signaling, is that correct? Commissioner Rosario? Yeah, that's right. I, I, I would just be curious to any commissioners who are voting differently than they voted on the one on Snell and Blossom Hill as to why when that one had a negative um, letter from the police and was already over-concentrated, why this one you would recommend vote, we would vote no rather than as you voted with the one on Snell and Blossom Hill. That's all. Got it. Anyone else? I, I would just okay, like to question. respond. Yeah. The, my concern is the school, the proximity to the school. Um, that's important to me, you know, um, as, uh, as a, also as a female, their students. I would like to see a part-time security guard there as soon as it gets dark for safety for female students from San Jose States or the community that, you know, go and go to the grocery outlet after dark. That's what I would like. That's important to me. Okay. Any other comments from the commission on the topic? We'll resume the roll call vote starting at the beginning. Commissioner Lardinois? Oh, and commissioner, does Commissioner Young vote at the beginning or the end? Either way, let's just go for it. Uh, commissioner Lardinois, on your vote, yes or no? Yes. Uh, commissioner Barosio? Yes. Commissioner Cantrell? Yes. Commissioner Casey? Yes. Commissioner Garcia? Yes. Commissioner Ornelas Wise? No. Commissioner Rosario? Yes. Commissioner Tordillos? Yes. And Commissioner Young? Uh, voting yes, no one else in the room. And myself is yes. That motion passes, and I think staff needs to display the vote. And then since the next item has been pulled, staff will present on item C, PDC 22001, and the other ones that are listed there. All right, let me switch gears here. Double duty tonight. All right, evening again, commissioners. Alec Atienza, planning project manager on the development review team. The item before you is 4C, so this is the Stack Trade Zone Park project. Uh, it's file numbers PDC 22001, PD 22001, and PT 22002. So this project is uh, three actions. So it's a planned development zoning, uh, and that would rezone this existing site at the corner of Ringwood and Trade Zone from an IP zoning district to a TEC planned development zoning district. So the base zoning district would be the Transit Employment Center zoning district. Uh, and then second, we have a planned development permit. That would allow the demolition of the two buildings you see on your screen there. Those are approximately 135,000 square feet total, as well as the removal of 156 trees for the construction of two data centers, uh, and that's totaling approximately 522,194 square feet and one 136,000 square foot manufacturing building, a 300 stall parking garage, as well as an electrical substation and 39 backup generators with 15 commercial condominiums. And then the third action is a vesting tentative map that would merge the two parcels and then subdivide the parcel into those condominiums. Uh, so in terms of project review, uh, this project was reviewed for conformance with the Envision San Jose 2040 general plan, uh, and specifically for the TEC general plan designation. The project was also reviewed for consistency with a municipal code for creation of a planned development zoning district, and then adhered to that created planned development zoning district, uh, which would follow the, the standards of the TEC zoning district. Uh, as well as the citywide design standards and guidelines and city council policy 6-30 for public outreach. Uh, we did hold a community meeting for this project on February 23rd. And the last piece of the puzzle is CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act. And here, this is a little bit different than what you're used to. So the California Energy Commission was actually the lead agency for this project. And they prepared and certified the Stack Trade Zone Park project final environmental impact report on April 12th, 2023, so earlier this month. 
And the final EIR identified potential impacts to air quality, biological resources, cultural and tribal resources, geology and soils, greenhouse gas emissions, hazards and hazardous materials, noise and transportation. And these impacts would be reduced to less than significant levels with the implementation of identified mitigation measures. And the FEIR did determine that there would be no significant and unavoidable impacts due to the implementation of the project. Uh, the mitigation measures are included in the Mitigation Monitoring and Reporting Program, MMRP for short, which the city must adopt as a responsible agency for the project. So again, the city is a responsible agency in this case under CEQA. And we do have CEQA staff here in case we have any questions about that process. Uh, so with that, staff recommends that the Planning Commission recommend to the City Council uh, that they adopt the resolution certifying the EIR adopt an ordinance rezoning an approximately 9.78 gross acre site, adopt a resolution approving a vesting tentative map, and adopt a resolution approving a plan development permit. And I want to defer to uh, the attorney real quick to um, explain the secret process. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Atienza. Um, so since the California Energy Commission is and has certified the EIR as a responsible agency, we're making findings pursuant to CEQA and adopting an MMRP. So basically, um, that first recommendation, adopt a resolution certifying the stack trade zone park environmental impact report should read, adopt a resolution making certain findings regarding the stack trade zone park. So um, when we're taking action, just to make sure that that is reflected in action. Okay, is there an applicant that would like to use their time to present to the commission? I see someone coming down from the audience. You'll have five minutes. Is that a presentation on a thumb drive? Do, so you yeah. let him load that up and Thanks before you that. start. Okay, there you go. Thank you so much. Is this good? Yeah, yeah. you're all set Thank to you go. so much. And great to be here tonight in person as well. Thank you so much for having us and, and pleasure to be presenting here in front of you all. Uh, good evening, Chair. Good evening, Council members. My name is, thank you so much. My name is Miles Kirsten, Director of Development at Stack Infrastructure. I'm proud to present our project here at 2400 Greenwood Avenue and 1849 Fortune Drive, a world-class project that will serve our Fortune 500 clients and generate hundreds of manufacturing jobs in the International Business Park in North San Jose, city's premier employment center. Stack Infrastructure is one of the largest data center operators in the world. We develop and operate world-class facilities in major U.S. markets like Northern Virginia, Dallas-Fort Worth, Portland, Phoenix, Santa Clara, and San Jose, as well as internationally in EMEA and Asia-Pacific Atlantic countries. In North San Jose, one of the most important technology markets in the world, Stack developed and owns two projects that we have named SVY-01A and SVY-01B. These projects total about 380,000 square feet. These assets are also powered by 100% renewable energy with LEED Gold certifications. We remain committed to North San Jose and our next investment includes a four-story state-of-the-art advanced manufacturing building, two three-story data center buildings, a parking structure, a backup generating facility, and all related utility infrastructure to support the project. As our CEO, Brian Cox, said about this project, we consider our ability to deliver cost-efficient renewable energy to be extremely important in this market where our clients are seeking strategic proximity. We are confident that our newest development will help our clients fulfill critical business requirements in a world-class facility. As we look at the benefits of the project, there are many, but to focus on a few, we estimate the creation of 198 permanent jobs, 128 at the advanced manufacturing building and 20, or excuse me, 70 at the data centers. Our general contractor holder is a signatory to the unions and 
will generate over 700 new union construction jobs during the execution of the project. Our project conforms and is consistent with city's land use policies, including general plan 2040, zoning ordinances, green building ordinance, and city economic development goals, including generation of new manufacturing jobs and generation of new general fund revenues. Offsite improvements and TDM measures include pedestrian network improvements, traffic calming measures, telecommuting and alternate work schedules. The California Energy Commission has certified the project environmental impact report on April 12th and found the project does not result in any significant impacts. STAC is a global leader in sustainability measures and implementation. The project will use 100% renewable energy sourced from PG&E's hydroelectric, solar, and other renewable energy sources. Our modern facilities will effectively use no water for cooling. We will utilize air-cooled chillers. We use recycled water from a purple pipe for landscaping, and we will install 41 EV charging stations during construction with capacity to add an additional 136 as adoption increases for a total of 177 EV stalls. Our project is located in the International Business Park in North San Jose. We're south of Montague Expressway on Trade Zone Boulevard between 880 and 680. Our project is located at the intersection of Trade Zone Boulevard to the north, Ringwood Avenue to the east, or northeast as shown in this image, between, excuse me, Fortune Drive borders the property to the south. On the right, we can see a project site plan. At the top of Trade Zone, we have the advanced manufacturing building shaded in green. Moving left to right, below that in orange, we have data center SVY05. To the right, we have the parking structure with approximately 339 parking stalls. And to the right of that, we have the oval shape that is the PG&E electrical substation. At the bottom, that looks like two parallel orange boxes, data center SVY06. Our parking structure enables this remarkably efficient use of site. Uh, please remember this parking garage pass through. We'll return to this later. Looking at the advanced manufacturing building from the corner of Trade Zone in Ringwood, we are proud to consider this modern design and efficient engineering the future of the North San Jose market. The first of its kind, a multi story Class A advanced manufacturing building in the submarket. This will increase the number of jobs due to the efficient multi story nature of the project and support City of San Jose's goals to prioritize creation of manufacturing jobs. Traditional advanced manufacturing space is historically single story, and by constructing a four story advanced manufacturing project, the building will see a significant increase in employees on site daily compared to a traditional single story advanced manufacturing space. San Jose's advanced manufacturing talent pool is 24 times greater than the, than the national average. This is 10 times denser than the average of the next nine most competitive metros and three and a half times denser than the next most competitive US metro, which is Seattle. Multi-story advanced manufacturing buildings are a necessity now given the immense supply constraints that have capped the market's new entrants while also creating upward pricing pressure on existing users, either renewing their leases or looking for advanced expansion space. We're now at that garage pass floor through uh, looking at the parking garage pass through and the SVY05 lobby entrance. I have applauded our design team, Corrigan, for providing this entrance experience, which is equivalent to premier office space in the Bay Area. The project is expected to commence construction in August of this year. Each major component is sequenced out to maximize efficiencies and safety. We currently project the project will be- Pardon me, Mr. Applicant. Uh, I don't think anyone set a timer. So I, I set it halfway in to give it an extra time. So you've actually gone over five minutes. Oh, thank you. And this, is, this was the final slide, perfect. Yeah, thank no you sweat. So yeah. If you maybe just want to finish up here, that'd be great. Great, thank you so much. Okay. Expected to commence construction in August of this year. Uh, each major component is sequenced out to maximize efficiencies and safeties. Uh, we currently project that we will have a fully complete and ready for full operation in June of 2026. And thank you everyone, uh, Cohen, Burton, Klein, Alec, Tina, other staff, uh, and all of you of course, and everyone that has been able to join us and participate online. Okay, thank, thank you. you so much. And uh, does the staff have any comments after the applicant's comments? No. no and we'll then, defer um, to questions. I'm sorry? No. And then um, 
to whoever's uh, administrating the meeting, are there any hands to speak on this item? We public? have one hand. Let me put up the timer. Okay, Paul Soto, you are unmuted. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you. Uh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, interesting. I would like uh, some questions answered. Um, does this, number one, you have 300 vehicles slated to go here. 300. Okay, and we're always talking about parking, parking, parking. We need to, you know, we need to get people get out of their cars. I want that reduced to 150 so that it's consistent. I know you, uh, somebody mentioned about consistency. Well, the, here's, here's where you can start practicing that, man, because you guys are cutting out all these cars during in the city, in the city limits, in District 3, in District 7, in District 5. I want this cut by 50%, the, trap, the, the, the car amounts. That's number one. Number two, I want to know, does the city of San Jose have access to this PG&E substation? You know, because, it, and this was on consent. That's the disgusting part, man. You guys are criminal in the way that you're moving these meetings because this was on consent. And you guys got a PG&E substation that needs to be built there in order to accommodate the uh, electricity that is gonna be necessary to run those uh, data centers. So what well, my question is, in the case of emergency, does the city of San Jose have access to that? I wanna know a, an explicit, just a simple answer, not none of your lawyer rhetoric, where you just run around, run around, run around with language, and it means nothing. Because lawyers are experts at saying a whole lot, and they say absolutely nothing. Experts. That's why they get paid to do that. So I want to know that. The question is, well, the, the, the demand, not a request. The demand is 50% cut in the amount of cars because you are decimating off the trees, man, 156 of them. I want to know, are they being replaced? Where and how many? Come on, man. And, and you guys are putting down this consent. This should be a shot. How do you guys sleep at night? And you know what? Probably pretty well because half of you are sociopaths and the other half are bordering on it. Thank you, Paul. Okay, moving on to the commission. I see Commissioner Cantrell has his hand up. Actually, I, I kind of parrot that statement. How, how does this get on the consent calendar? Um, it, it just, it had a boatload of questions in my mind. Um, and I think, you know, not that this is a bad project, I'm not saying that, I'm just saying the public should hear the things that this gentleman said today, um, as well as understand the impacts of these projects. Yeah, so uh, it's really based on generally public interest. If projects don't have too much public interest, we, we don't put it on the public hearing. Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, that's an answer. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, actually, I had a number of questions before you spoke. I, I think you answered most, um, and you answered them well. And actually, this, is, this project seems pretty amazing, actually and is actually scheduled to get done. What do you know? That happens. <laughs> um, I did have a, a few things. You know, we, we, we changed the parking requirements for a reason, and that's your decision to make. I am curious, though. It does seem heavy. Um, are there any opportunities for mass? Does it, is it close to mass transit at all? Um, is there, are there bike uh, um, lockers? What else do you provide in st that might reduce the amount of cars on site? Absolutely, and, and we did, we actually did reduce parking by 32% on site, uh, and this is proximity to trans, uh, transportation. We are also providing secure bike lockers as well as motorcycle parking for folks that are not driving cars. Um, but we did uh, reduce, given our transit-oriented uh, focus location, we did reduce parking up to, uh, I believe it was 32%. Okay, and, and you said this was uh, already union uh, approved, basically? Correct. Okay, um, the, my only other issue is the number of trees being removed. Uh, how many are being replaced? We are replacing, I have that number. 40, 47 on site. Thank you so much. 
Gotcha. Okay. Um, and then the, the rest are funds. You got it. I, about three hundred twenty thousand dollars. Okay. I. We have a tree canopy problem here. Severe. Um, it's a data center. Even though it's an efficient data center, they draw a lot and they create a lot of negative impact. Um, it seems to me a bit perverse to remove trees and not replace them. And it, from the drawings, it looks like you can't have a green roof there because of what are those cooling towers? Or, okay. Um, I, I'd, I'd love to see that offset be something better than just putting money in the coffer that we all know we don't manage that program very well. Um, and those trees may or may not get planted and are likely to die within a year or two anyway because no one's going to water them. Um, so those are my concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Barosio. Perfect. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you for presenting on behalf of your, your um, applicant. Um, a question on... Uh, for staff, um, I'm really curious about public interest. Um, is it uh, like the amount of emails that are generated? Is it, uh, I just kind of want to wonder, um, and just also for the benefit of everyone here, um, when things go to consent, when things don't, like what are the, what's the rubric, what's the measuring stick um, for that? Thank you. Comes in the Borussia, um, the city council has a council policy. 6-30 that deals with outreach. Each project is categorized under its size, uh, the nature and scope, large projects, medium projects, and small projects. By size, this will be categorized as a large project. We follow specific requirements, but all along there has never been community interest. So with regards to how we put projects on consent, it depends on community interest. We have a sequel section that deals with the IRs. Uh, CEC was the lead agency that prepared the CEQA. They, dealt, they coordinated with our CEQA staff throughout the process. As part of the scoping meeting and the development review, there was no community interest. And we are not sure whether it's because of the location or the nature of the project, but the project also checked all the boxes that we are required to look at. So, because there was no community interest, and no one has actually contacted the project manager, besides coordinating with the project applicant and CEC. So that is the reason why. But all the information that has been prepared prior to this hearing is online and is publicly available. And, and Robert, quick comment. It's also when items come forward where it's pretty much allowed and what the city wants, and then that doesn't raise to the level of a, a dramatic change, and therefore that's why it goes on consent as well? That's correct. And again, if a city council member, sorry, planning commissioner requests that something be pulled, we do so and answer questions. So that's exactly what happened here. No, perfect. Thank you for... And one more, Robert, uh, Commissioner Barroso. Robert, and if commissioners want to pull... Is it better that they notify staff prior so they have time to prepare? Because on consent items, you don't necessarily have a PowerPoint uh, ready to go. That is correct. And most of the times, it really helps if uh, questions are asked earlier on. And in most instances, when we answer those questions, they don't. It doesn't. It's not even called during the hearing. But uh, so hopefully, uh, if there are any questions on other projects subsequently, we'll be able to answer them before we even come to the hearing. No. Specifically for this project, no community interest. And I think, not that I think, I know that the California Energy Commission also did a very thorough outreach. Thank you. Thank you for highlighting those opportunities and the steps where, where um, it's gauged of what would be on consent um, and what would be in public hearing. Uh, and just curious, um, is that something that at at our commission meeting that we have to um, say, hey, like let's pull this to public hearing or is that something that we can do beforehand? I think uh, per the, what we were having and saying is if a commissioner has an interest in pulling something from the consent calendar, you could and probably uh, be better for staff if you sent an email and said, hey, I'm gonna pull this item. I have a 16 questions or a high level of interest. So that way staff knows and 
they can coordinate and have things ready versus, you know, they don't have a full deck prepared typically for consent calendar items. Right. And just for clarity, it only takes one commissioner or does that have to go around the table? I believe uh, any, com it just, yeah, any commissioner can say, hey, I'd like to pull this item, just like a member of the public can say, I'd like to speak on that consent calendar item. Perfect, thank you. Thank you so much for the clarity. Okay, moving to Commissioner Lardinois. Yeah, um, I just wanted to clarify on the parking. I, I think I have it, and if I'm not correct, staff can let me know. I believe this project was in the pipeline before the parking minimums were abolished, and so my understanding is this project is providing the minimum amount that it's required to. Exactly. Is that correct? Yeah, Robert's laughing at me. We had this discussion. Okay, so it was a, uh, the project was um, deemed complete prior to this new ordinance going into effect, so it's subject to the old ordinance. So we, because they're doing a 32% parking reduction, they have to implement a TDM plan regardless. Um, and that includes, I think they have to do showers, lockers, mm -hmm. transit incentive program, things like that. Uh, one of the things that we baked into their plan development zoning standards, if you look at that attachment, is that they have the option to come back in later on to utilize the updated parking code if they'd like. So if they want to change their TDM measures, they have that flexibility to do so under the new parking code. Thank you. Commissioner Tordillos. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to start by just echoing some of the comments that have already been made in public comment and from my fellow commissioners about parking. Uh, so I want to acknowledge that this uh, site is in a transit employment district. It is easy walking and biking distance from the Milpitas BART, and there are bus uh, stops directly in front of the site. Uh, but in light of all of that, it looks like we still have nearly 150 more parking spaces in this garage than actual jobs that we're expecting to be created from the data center and the manufacturing facilities. Uh, so I guess my question for the project applicant would just be if there's anything uh, that reducing that number of parking spaces uh, you would view as reducing the viability of the development, or if you are actually open to coming back with decreasing uh, parking further. Mm -hmm. During construction, a lot of the parking stalls will be utilized by the folks that are building out the spaces, the, general, the contractors, and that a lot of that will require a lot more parking, and this will reduce the impact on the neighboring streets. Uh, during the actual execution, we will offsite, we'll park in a neighboring uh, lot, uh, once we actually have the parking structure built up, we'll use that to, to park everyone so that the neighboring streets are not impacted. And so this parking structure, uh, as proposed, enables us to have that a little bit of uh, overflow parking, as well as for future clients to have guests come uh, beyond just their base parking. Um, but as Aleph mentioned, this was uh, after, uh, excuse me, before the updates were made. Um, and so as proposed is how we see it fit. Thank you. Uh, I mean, obviously, I would love to see you come back uh, with further reductions in parking, but we'll see. Uh, and then my second question was related to, again, tree removals, and this one was for staff. Uh, it looks like this in lieu of fee, as others have noted, is a huge sum of money, $326,000 and change. Uh, do you have on hand the total amount of in lieu of fees that have been collected in D4 up until now? No, we do not. Uh, because the planning department does not administer that. It's administered by a DOT, Department of Transportation. We, we collect the fees, uh, so prior to them um, receiving their building permits, we'll collect those fees, but it'll go to the Department of Transportation, and we're currently undergoing a tree audit right now, so hopefully that, that, will, um, that process will improve. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I've read up on this a little bit uh, prior to today's meeting, and my understanding is that this single <laughs> projects in lieu of fees may in fact be more than all in lieu of fees that have ever been gathered in D4. Uh, and I also read that, you know, up until now, the city hasn't had a great track record in actually effectively spending that money, getting trees planted, following up on, you know, the success of those plantings, as other commissioners have mentioned. Uh, so I understand that we're in the process of updating the tree canopy uh, policies citywide, as well as the in lieu of fee program. Uh, but uh, earlier this year, I remember in a council meeting, there was also a presentation about uh, the current tree canopy landscape through an equity lens, uh, and it called out that D4, where this project is located, is currently tied for the worst tree canopy coverage of any district citywide, I believe tied with District 7, 
Uh, so I guess my ask moving forward as we update these policies would be, it would be great to see as much of this in lieu, huge sum of in lieu of fees rededicated to, if not District 4, at least District 4 and the other, you know, districts that are disproportionately impacted by lack of tree coverage. Thank you. And Commissioner, there is a nexus for uh, these types of fees to be spent in the area it's generated, just much like a park fee. I don't know what that number that oh we have a comment I no I, I actually had just a little addition to that we just had a project that was approved in district four that was a huge industrial project that just raked in seven hundred eighty seven thousand dollars for tree fees that didn't come before this commission but yeah so that was in district four great that was at a approved at a director's hearing yeah believe it or not it was yeah so yeah. even less <laughs> right so if people yeah. concerned about consent calendar there are, we have some different projects that go to director's hearing because they are just simply abiding by what the city wants in the general plan and that type of thing uh okay uh, commissioner ornelas wise I, i'd first like to say um that it's it looks like a beautiful project um it's a beautiful design the modern technology this is silicon valley it matches the environment it's beautiful and the fact that you've taken, you know, it's LEED certified or all that, that's fantastic. That's what we like to see. We want to see a lot of great projects like this. So I commend you for all the hard work that you've got here. Uh, so congratulations to both everyone that worked on it, plus staff. I know it takes a lot of work to just get here. Um, <clears throat> of course, um, I'm going to ask, is there any child care proposed for? No on-site child care facility. Okay. No. You know, of course, you know, I'm asking these questions because, um, you know, it's, uh, I think uh, the fact that uh, a lot of people have had the luxury to work from home for so long, we've realized how important it is to be with families, right? And so I think that a lot of people exit out because there's not proper childcare, right? So um, I would hope that when you're designing this or future things, you really take into consideration um, having childcare on site, right? Eventually the child turns five, goes to school or whatnot, but you know, for smaller kids, I, I would highly recommend that for staff retention and uh, for health and wellness for everybody in the community. Um, I also wanted to ask about offsite improvements. Um, what offsite improvements are being made um, can you talk about that? Absolutely. So at the corner of Ringwood and Trade Zone, we are enhancing that whole, uh, our side of the inter intersection, as well as implementing a new bike lane. Uh, the bike lane will have a hard divide as well as come up on sidewalk to prevent uh, a bigger, um, excuse me, to enhance the buffer between vehicles and bicycles. Okay, good. Um, Okay, that's a, I, I, of course I wanted to look at traffic impacts. I don't know if uh, staff from CEQA wanted to talk about maybe any traffic impacts. Hi, this is uh, Tina Kirk. Uh, I'm the CEQA project manager. So the project was screened out of uh, VMT. It's within a uh, low VMT area. So uh, there was no VMT analysis done for the project. Uh, and uh, the other impacts regarding circulation, um, design hazards, and everything else was uh, determined to be less than significant. Uh, and as uh, Alec mentioned, the project includes a TDM uh, plan that would address um, car, in things like car sharing, um, um, alternate work schedule, and things like that. So uh, there was no VMT analysis done for the, needed for the project as per the CEQA guidelines. Okay, thanks. That's all my questions. Good job. Commissioner Larnois. Thank you. <clears throat> and so just to be clear, just going back to what Commissioner Ornelas Wise said about child care, there may not be a child care facility on site, but if a tenant wanted to operate one, I mean, there's nothing stopping them from trying to do that, right? Well, yeah, a permit, of course, but like, I mean. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's office space, right? <laughs> yeah, anyways. They, they will have to apply for a permit amendment and we'll look into it whether it's appropriate or whether it's functionally uh, compatible with the land use. Yeah, they would need a, a special use permit for a daycare center in transit employment center zoning district. Even though it's industrial, we still allow it. Right. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Cantrell. 
Actually, um, I think this is a great project. Um, it's a far better project than I actually imagined it would be. Uh, with hearing this from you, and I, and I understand why it's not on a consent calendar, um, I would give this my consent. And as a matter of fact, I move that we approve this proposal um, because I, I think it is exactly what it should be. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any other comments from commissioners? Uh, Commissioner? Yeah, as I second it, so it's obvious I'm supportive of the project. It's a great project. Just a question out of curiosity, and this kind of ladders up to the question about parking. Was there any consideration given? Because I know a lot of developers now are repurposing or at least building parking with the idea of repurposing it down the line. So was this ever a consideration in this project? It will be going forward, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Any other comments? Oh, I'm certainly supporting the motion. This is what we've always wanted in the north part of San Jose is jobs, jobs, jobs. Thank you for your investment. I certainly hope that the financing does come through to build as your desired timeline that you shared with us. I think it's great to have advanced manufacturing. And for any and all of us that use our devices, I mean, we'd be fooling ourselves to not think we don't need these types of facilities. It doesn't magically appear the bandwidth. So that's how these... Uh, facilities enable us to move as an, uh, an economy. So thank you very much. So with that said, we have a motion, we have a second, and I'll, we'll do a yes, no vote. Commissioner Lardinois. Yes. Oh, hang on, okay. we got the city attorney. Sorry, you guys thought you were gonna get out of here. Um, just wanna make sure that that staff recommendation includes the brief amendment that I made at the beginning of this item, which is instead of certifying, this is under recommendation one, instead of certifying, we're going to be making certain findings regarding the EIR. Is that okay with the maker of the motion and the seconder? Okay. Just wanted to make that clarification. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Commissioner Lardinois. Yes. Commissioner Barrosio. Yes. Commissioner Cantrell. Yes. Commissioner Casey. Yes. Commissioner Garcia. Yes. Commissioner Ornelas Wise. Yes. Commissioner Rosario. Yes. Commissioner Tordillos. Yes. And online, the ever-present Commissioner Young, where are you? Yes, and no one else in the room with you. Congratulations. And myself, yes. Thank you all. Completed that. We are move, now move on to the good and welfare report from City Council. Robert? Yes, we only have a report from yesterday. So the city-led engagement process for Pleasant Hill Golf Course was approved by Council. Okay. And, and uh, Robert, can we ask, make a request of you that at a future meeting, sometime in the future, you know, within the next few months, could you come back and uh, share with us the question on how much fees have been collected for trees and how much has been spent or yet to be spent? Because it's a question that keeps coming up. So ask the particular department and just let us know as a little factoid. Yes, I must say that uh, an audit is still ongoing. Okay. Uh, we don't have immediate answers to that. Until that is completed, we wouldn't, but I'll keep you informed when. Let's do this completed. then. When that audit is complete, whoever's chair, whatever, just come back and say, hey, these were the summary findings or something just as an informational item. Definitely, and I'll look into the possibility of a study session too, if that is possible. Oh, I don't, I don't know if we need a study session, but just bringing back that information <laughs> okay. would be fine. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll have to vote on that one. Uh, okay, uh, I don't believe we have anything on item we B. Do. But we, we do, do. excellent. Yes. Uh, so uh, the Capital Improvement Program Special Meeting is scheduled for Wednesday, May 10th at 5 p.m in the tower, room 332. We are on the third floor, room 332 of the tower. Uh, but that will be only for the special meeting. The, the reason being uh, dinner will be served and we can't eat dinner here. So from five to six and then six o'clock we'll come back to the- 6.30. Six, sorry, 6.30. So yeah. five o'clock will be our study session, the 10th floor. And on the third floor. Third, third floor. floor. And then come third back third. here, we'll have an adequate, adequate time to get over here for our 6.30 meeting. That's correct. Okay. Great. And chair, have an item. Oh, hey, right. look, it's the city attorney. Again, another comment. Um, so Actually, you'd ask me. Oh, oh sorry. Tomorrow. And when is, what date is the study session meeting that you were the tenth. talking about? Tenth. The 10th. Okay, of May. Our At next 5 meeting. 5 p.m., yep. May 10th. So let me, uh, since dinner will be provided during the special meeting, the meeting will be held in T332, 
per security, we cannot serve food in the chambers. Once the special meeting has ended, the regular PC will be held in the chambers at 6.30. And Robert, is that a uh, recorded meeting? The special meeting, I do not think so. It's well, it, not cameras in the conference room. It right? will be recorded because it's hybrid, yes. So it'll be a voice recording? That's correct. Okay, got it. Okay, it's Commissioner Lardenwa, nothing? So someone over here, is it Commissioner, did anyone have a comment to the right? No. Nope. Okay. Anything else? Well, oh, yeah, for me? Yeah, yeah. that's right. <laughs> for, so the last meeting you directed me or asked me to that's come right. back on teleconferencing rules or legislation that might be in the legislature. So I wanted to kind of honor that request and make sure that you were aware that there are two bills currently um, in the California legislature. That's AB 817 uh, by Assemblymember Pacheco and then uh, SB 411, that's Senator Portentillo, P Portentino, excuse me. Um, so I'm not going to comment on the bills per se, but basically what those bills would do would be making um, teleconferencing possible for all commissioners as well, right? So what we were doing during the pandemic would make that permanent, because I think um, that may be related to the question you had asked. But I just wanted to make sure that the commission understood that the, in, that the city manager's office has an intergovernmental affairs relation team and they continue to lobby state legislators uh, in support of these bills mm. and in support of any bills that would expand current teleconferencing rules. Yeah, yes, because several commissioners uh, quit when they, when they came back in and weren't allowed to teleconference, so I figured that would be pertinent. And so in, uh, out of curiosity, does it say either of those bills, like when are they, is it something like a July time frame when they're passed and, and if signed or something, or is it a two-year bill or? Um, so I will have, I will ask you to do your own research. Okay. Um, wow. <laughs> I'm happy to provide a link, <laughs> but, um, oh, I could have looked those bills. Okay. That, never mind. Yeah. I, so legindfo.com is a wonderful, or .gov is a wonderful, um, resource. Excellent. Thank you. Public record, nothing. Adjournment. Thank you for commissioners. I know sometimes we try to stop, we'll go through some of these items and we have a lot of questions and appreciate everyone's patience and kindness as we go through that with with staff and everyone else. So thank you very much. Good night.